Abba Father, we ask that you be with us as we go over the wonderful things that your word has to teach us. We thank you that whereas people have been able, on earth have been able to, to uh, mess up with the story of redemption, nobody yet has been able to, able to mess up with the story of redemption as was written in the stars. And we thank you that we can read it today. B'Shem Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. So, we will start with a little video. Two minutes or something. That I wanted to show you yesterday. That explains what is the ecliptic circle. Here you go. The, and I'm sorry, there is an advertisement for hamburgers at the, to at the beginning. But this is not me sponsoring hamburgers. Okay. Okay, here you go. Here you go. Okay. Protect your family's dreams under our roof. American Family Insurance. That's not me. Okay, now, now, now. Stargazers, Trace Dominguez here. Our solar system is more or less like a spinning pancake. The sun is in the middle and the planets and celestial bodies all revolve a flat plane or a disk. We can see this in the sky as the ecliptic, an imaginary line around the planet stretching from Pisces and Pause. the Okay, so you saw the circle of the ecliptic, the sun and the earth, okay? The ecliptic circle is where the sun is, uh, no, from the perspective of the earth, that's what it is. Okay, go ahead. So, and it's, it's, it's important to know, there's one thing about the astronomy, it doesn't change, it's mathematical. You can figure out the sky in the days of Yeshua, or in the days of Pharaoh, you can figure it out, because mathematics is godly, and I'm really bad at mathematics. But it, it, it's got, it's, it's the thing that's constant and doesn't change. So now I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to slide 18. Okay, sorry. Because that's where we left last night. Uh oh, 18, come on. Here, 18. That's where we left last night. Do I have my, my clicker? Is it working? No. Okay. Uh, uh, should be okay now okay that's what we left last night I was telling you that the 12 constellations were divided into three books three volumes three volumes each one with four books four times three is very good you know so the volume one the first manifestation of the Redeemer. Redeemer, capital R. The slain victim, the son of Joseph. You all know the, the, the idea of the son of Joseph and the son of David. The two Messiah. No, it's, it's one Messiah in two different functions. Son of Joseph, the innocent victim, the babe in the manger, crucified. The son of David conquering Jerusalem. That's what David did. And becoming a king. The lamb and the lion. So, but in between the first volume one and volume three, 
volume 3, the second manifestation of the Redeemer, the revenge of the king. There is the congregation of Messiah. We're not going to do that tonight. And I promise it's going to get much faster. Tonight we're going to go into some, but then it's going to go much faster. So, um, let's see, what do I have next here? So here is how it works. This is the whole first volume. You have the constellations of Virgo. Maybe I should look at my paper. Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius. How do they refer to the Bible story? Okay, that's the second book, Capricornus, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries. The third book is Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and Leo. You know, so this is, th this is how it works. And it's really the story of redemption written in the stars. And I want to remind you that people have not used the stars to make dot-to-dot -dot stuff. Okay? The art and the theology of this teaching has to do with the names of the stars, and we'll get back to that. Okay, what, what do I have next? Oh, okay. Virgo, the Virgin. Now we will start with the, that first constellation, which is a constellation where the sun is right now. That's why I started with it. We're in the time of Virgo, the Virgin. How in the world did they get a virgin out of this cluster of stars? How? It's really a question. Like I said, it's not like playing dot to dot. Um, look at this. Oh, everything's coming right. I did a great job. <laughs> Psalm 147.4 says, He determines how many stars there are, and calls them by name. He calls them by name. And then in Isaiah 40, he summons each of them by name. Whoa. You remember I was telling you how Seth, the son of Adam, learned these things, and we knew it from the book of Josephus. King David said, in Psalms, said God calls his stars by name. And they were in ancient time in Aramaic, which is a, a derivative of Hebrew. I, I watched the movie The Passion, which was in both Aramaic and Latin. Because I know Hebrew, Aramaic was, sounded quite familiar, just a little bit of variations here and there. And I know Italian. So Latin sounded very familiar too. But uh, Aramaic is very close to Hebrew. So the art to understand why, why here we get a virgin out of this cluster of stars is because the name and the art was chosen, no, no, the art was chosen according to the names of the stars, which Seth had been given. So, and look at this timeline. Okay? Yeah, I'm going to show you this timeline. I don't know if you can see. The top one is Adam. The bottom one is Abraham. Okay? If you look at it, people lived a long time. From, let's say, let's say you're Adam. <laughs> Adam? You've got the whole story of, 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 of the Garden of Eden. I mean, this is the most important story in the world. You pass it on. It's like it's a school of those days. You pass it on. So, but if you look here, let's say, let's say, if you, from Adam, if he passes it on to Methuselah, who is the man who lives the longest in the world, in the world, Methuselah can pass it on to Noah. Two people from Adam to pass on the story of the Garden of Eden. And from Noah, of course, to Shem. Shem was alive in the days of Abraham. You know, according to this timeline, which is all timelines of the patriarchs agree. 
just four or five people. You know, and this was the most important story in the world, to be honest. You know, so, and, and some people even deduce, and I cannot say it is or it's not, and I don't want to go on that rabbit trail right now, but that Melchizedek that came to meet Abraham was actually Shem. It wouldn't surprise me, but I can't prove it. But it is in the realm of the possible, because Shem was a, alive. Shem would have known that story from his father, Noah, who could have learned it from Methuselah, very possibly, who could have learned it from Adam. Methuselah was a very holy man. You know, so, um, so that, that's important. Now, okay. Okay, so that's, that's good. Now, some of the names of the stars were changed. And I'm not going to go into all the history of it. But this book tells you the whole history of it. But if you get this book, I want to warn you. It's not an easy read. It's complicated. It's not like a story, like I'm trying to make it into a story. It's, it's complicated. It's colorly. You know, but it tells you the, the story of the names of the stars in Aramaic. So here is our Virgo. You see there's stars and everything, and this is an idea that was given. She is represented with a branch in her right hand and some ears of corn in, their left, in her left hand. This is absolutely prophetic. A twofold testimony of the coming one as I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. She is holding grain in her hand. Grain, the word zera. Can you say zera? Zera in Hebrew means seed, as in seed of produce. But seed as also as um, descendants. So we say your seed, and it, it talks about both of them. So here we have this virgin holding seed. And um, there is also a prophecy in. Uh, Zechariah 3.8, that says, that calls the Messiah, and the, one of the names of the stars in, in, in her is Tzemach. Tzemach. Tzemach means, oh, branch. The Messiah is called branch in Zechariah 3.8. So these things come really deep study of a, uh, of a, uh, of Knowledge of prophecy. T to have this virgin, yeah, yeah, Virgo, you know, Virgo. She has the signs of Messiah in her hand. The branch and the seed. There's a very famous virgin in the Bible. You all know who it is. Miriam, Mary. Miriam, she's a descendant of Eve. Of whom it was said, the sin of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. Okay? So, let's look. I want you to look at this here. Okay, this is, this is a map of the constellations. Okay? Do you see the Virgin, Virgo? Do you see it? Go down. There's something that looks like an eel or a snake. That constellation is called Draco. It's the snake. Draco, the snake. Okay? So, now, you can see that snake waiting for the seed of the woman to devour it. We'll talk about it later. So, here you have 
Like I said yesterday, each constellation is accompanied by three friends. They're called, I don't know how to say it in English, but decans, D-E-C-A-N-S. S as in the plural, decan. It means lesser bright. These are constellations that are br of a le lesser brightness of the main constellation of Virgo. It's calculated in luminums and whatever. The book explains, the book I showed you before explains all that, if you can understand it. You know, so, and those are the three friends of Virgo. And the first one is the one at the top. It's a, a woman looking a bit like an Egyptian woman or something, you know, the people who do the art, and a child. And that constellation is called Koma. And what it means is the desired one. The Messiah is the desired one. Coming out of a constellation of the Virgin. Do you see the Virgin right beside it? Holding the branch? You know, it's connected together. You know, so it's, I think it's beautiful. Um, the desired one from the virgin. And then, and then you have the, the horseman type of thing, the centaur. You might say, oh my gosh, Rabbi Gabriel is getting into Greek uh, mythology here. No, the idea is not that. The idea is, is, a, is of an entity that is of a double nature. The double nature, which we read in Colossians 12, 9, where it says that in Messiah, in him bodily lives the fullness of all that is God. Bodily lives all the fullness of all that is God. God is spirit. That's fundamental to Jewish teaching. God is spirit. Even Yeshua says God is a spirit. That's it. It doesn't have any bodily form. That's, that's absolutely there is, there is no um, um, compromise on that. But he sends his spirit in the form of flesh. So Paul, the way he says it in Colossians, in him, in Yeshua, bodily lives the fullness of all that is God. A double nature being. Man, animal. Does that make sense? You see, so we have the virgin giving birth to the divine, to the, to the desired one, who is a double natured being. In him lives God. Ooh, spirit and flesh. Ooh, boy. Who becomes the great harvester of the earth, which we read in Revelation 14. Okay. Revelation 14, 14. You can read it yourself. It's in Revelation 14, 14, where Yeshua the, is, come, is called the great harvester of the earth. He comes to harvest the earth, you know. So we see the story here of Yeshua just in those three things. And again, the story is not built on people trying to make dot to dot and making a story that compares to the Bible. No. It's the names of the stars that told the people who studied this the story. And this book that I showed you goes into that. It goes into the names of the stars. And I'm not going to go there now because we'll never get out and we'll only have three days, two days, you know. So... But you can read the book. Um, and this book is accepted by many teachers and, uh, yeah, teachers and it's a, yeah. So now, now but what about this woman with seed? I think God created mankind. Can everybody agree with my, with that? He's the author of the biology of mankind. Can everybody agree with me on that? He knows that women have no seed. 
I'm sorry. I didn't do this. If you're not happy with it, go to God. Man have seed. And I don't need to show pictures and whatever, you know. You understand what I mean? But he says the seed of the woman. <clears throat> Hello? The seed of the woman. And the only person that we know, a woman who gave birth while a virgin was Miriam. And um, I, I read a biological thing about it that says there can be a case where there is seeding or something. I don't know how that works. But somehow she was seeded. It says, the text says, by the Holy Spirit. I don't know how that worked. God can do whatever he wants. Even create a life in a woman without being, quote unquote, seeded. Okay? I'm not going to try to explain it. I'm not God. You know, if you want to know how he did that, you can ask him. You know, I'm sure he'll answer you. But, um, it says the seed of the woman will crush your head to the serpent. There's only one woman that I know of in the Bible that had, that was a virgin seeded, however that works. So I want to show you something else. This is the camp of the Israelites in the desert. What you see here, you know, it's really like a, Like, like when an army, an army would walk, in old-fashioned army, medieval times, they would walk towards the enemy. The leaders, the, if, and if the king was there, maybe the king or the leader would be in the middle because that's the best protection. There's all the soldiers around. And the same thing here. You have the king, the tabernacles, in the middle of everybody else. And they walked in that order. The first was Judah okay so if you look at it okay this is from numbers the book of numbers you have the tabernacle in the middle the Levites tribe tribes between the tabernacle and the other tribes okay and all the other tribes in numbers 1 2 each tribe was requested to make a flag, a standard or something with a picture. And most of the pictures, all, if not all of them, came from Moses' prophecy or Jacob's, Moses, no, no, sorry, from Jacob's prophecy about each tribe at the end of the book of Genesis. Like it says, oh, Zebulun and your ships because you'll be by the sea. Ah, yeah, it's a ship, the flag, the standard. So, but, but as you can see here, there was three tribes on each side. Christians like to say, no, 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 it's not like that. It's three tribes like this, three tribes like this, three tribes like this, and it makes a cross. But that's not historically correct. <laughs> that's how it was. Okay, so... So you have the Levites, because the Levites, and we'll talk about the Levites a little bit. The Levites come in between, in between the tabernacle and the tribes. The Levites are the this internet server, you know, th that connects between the two. So, so you have the three now. I have three, pi four pictures around. Uh, I wanted to make this simpler and not have all the 12 pictures and everything. But because the middle tribe was the lead of the three tribes. On each side, the middle tribe was the lead, okay? So on the east side, uh, you have the camp of Judah. Maybe it's not the little middle tribe. But on the east side, Judah was the leader, the lion, the lion of Judah. On the north side, Dan was the leader, the eagle Okay, those are, those are the camp things, the flags of Numbers 1, 2. 
uh, numbers two, I guess. Sorry. On the west side, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, it was a lamb. It was a cow. Sorry, a cow. I know the picture is not really good. And on the south side, Reuben. Reuben was, uh, they're not the middle ones. I've seen chart with the, they were all the middle ones. But Reuben was the leader with a picture of a man. Okay? So here you have a lion, an eagle, an ox, and a man. Now, you'll notice that of all the sons of Jacob, Joseph doesn't have a tribe. You see, um, Joseph, he knew about this. He knew about the constellation of the ecliptic circle. Ooh, how did he know? I, don't, I, I can only say this was knowledge that was passed on from place to place. But he knew about it. We know it because he had a dream. You remember he had a dream about 12 sheaves? No, 11 sheaves bowing to him. And then he had a dream about the 11 stars. In Hebrew, the word star is kochav. Can you say kochav? Kochav is, means star. But not just star. It means constellation. And he was one of them. So he saw, he saw, he saw the 11 stars, constellation, and the moon and the sun bowing to him. You know that story, right? It's in, uh, it's in Genesis 37. So, it means both. So basically, Joseph saw his father, uh, his father and his mother and all the other 11 constellations as his brothers. You know, when you look at the story of Jacob, how he ended up with all these 12 children 12 boys and one girl. Did God plan all that? He must have thought, come on, God, I only wanted this one, Rachel. And I get stuck with four mothers of 12 boys. I only wanted Rachel. Who knows what God's plans are in our lives? So, but uh, he had this prophecy about his children, about his brothers and his mother and father that were bowing to him using the 11 constellations and the sun and the moon. And it's a prophecy that actually came true, okay, when he came to, where are my slides here? Okay, I didn't write it, sorry. It's a prophecy that actually came true when it says in Genesis 42, 6, Yosef was govern governor of the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. You know, I heard a teacher say one time that Yosef was the inventor of communism. What? Look at what he did. <laughs> I mean, the guy was a smart cookie. What he did, he told Pharaoh, look, uh, <clears throat> there's going to be a famine. So have everybody tithe 20%, not 10, the word tithe means 10, so I don't know, uh, to, to twinth, because <laughs> it's tithe into 20% of all their, 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 their income for seven years. And put it away. So basically, they were giving as a tax 20% of their crops. And Joseph organized, I mean, it, 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 it's insane to have barns and everything so the, the grain doesn't go bad. It, it, took, it was supernatural intelligence in those days, uh, you know, to keep that grain. And after seven years, the very grain that was given was sold to the people who had given it. <laughs> government, yes. <laughs> they sell you what uh, you've given to them. <laughs> oh, boy. But then, after doing the seven years of famine, 
There came a time where people ran out of money. So Joseph said, oh, it's okay. Just pay with your collateral. Your land, your animals, your house. And then even all that, it was such a bad famine. All that even lost it. So what did he say? It's okay. Pay with yourselves. And the whole story ends with the Tanakh saying, and all of Egypt belonged to Pharaoh. That means all the land, all the animals, and all the people, they became Pharaoh's property because they sold themselves to Pharaoh in order to buy the grain that they had given to Pharaoh. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, but basically what, what, what happened is that Canaan, where Jacob's family was, like you have Egypt here, Canaan is a bit south, or north, not far. They came to Joseph to get some grain, and they didn't know it was Joseph. What does Genesis 42, 6 say? Joseph was gov governor over the land. It was he who sold to all the people of the land, what, who sold them what they had given him. Now, when Joseph's brothers came and prostrated themselves before him on the ground, that prophecy came, became fulfilled. His mother, Rachel, was dead. So she couldn't prostrate herself. But his father, when he came, he had to prostrate himself to the governor of Egypt. So, um, so, 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 so here you see in this picture here, Joseph doesn't have a tribe. It's because, you know, Joseph was a favorite of Jacob. He was the firstborn because he was a son of Rachel. To the firstborn you confer double inheritance. But when Jacob tried to show Joseph favor, it really created a lot of problems <laughs> in the family. But J Jacob still had the last word. So what did he do to give Joseph double inheritance? Uh, okay, what he did was, I thought I had write, written it down. In Genesis 48, 5 and 6, we read that before he died, Jacob wanted to have his children come to him. And he had first the children of Joseph come to him, Ephraim and Manasseh. And what did Jacob said? Um, um, now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt, before I came to you in Egypt, they are mine. I am adopting your two sons. Basically, they, they will become brothers to your uncles, to their uncles. He's adopting them as his own children. And in this way, the tribe of Joseph gets two shares in the land, Ephraim, which was one of the most populous tribe, and Manasseh. He, he was a smart cookie, Jacob. He wanted to give Joseph what he knew he wanted to give Joseph. He had chosen him as firstborn, as per, you know, and he, he needed to be a bit wise, I don't know. But he gave Joseph a double inheritance, and inheritance was it not just an inheritance of money and flocks, but the inheritance of Jacob was the promises made to Abraham in the land. You know, so, so here, back to our four leading tribes. Oh, here, back to our four leading tribes. Each tribe has a standard. The standard of the tribe of Judah is a lion, of Reuben is a man, of Dan is an eagle, and of Joseph and Ephraim a bull. The bull is actually Joseph with two horns, Ephraim and Manasseh. In Revelation, we read, Revelation 4, 1 through 8. Basically, it's, it's, 
It's the fall feast. Revelation is all about the fall feast. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Tabernacles. He says, before me there was a door standing open in the heaven. There is a door. Heaven is open between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We know that. In Revelation 1, he hears the voice like a shofar. Ha ha. And then a door in heaven is open. Ha ha. A Jew who reads that says, ha ha. I know what that is. But then he says, he sees the throne of God. And around the throne, what does he see? He sees four, they're called cherubim. Cherubim. One cherubim, the first living being, it's a cherubim, was like a, a lion, Judah. The second was like an ox, tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. The third, like a man, Reuben. And the fourth, like an eagle, Dan. Is there a little bit of a pattern here? between that and the ecliptic circle and this thing about the constellations? You see how all the tribes are placed? You have the, you have the, the lion, the man, the, the bull, and the, and the eagle. Levi doesn't have a tribe either. Levi is around. Um, Levi, Le Levi is around. Now, Levi was, doesn't have a tribe. He was cursed. Because um, if you remember when Jacob was in Shechem and their sister Dinah was raped or by the prince of Shechem, Jacob made a deal with the people of Shechem said, look, 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 we're, you're good, we're good, Let's, we cannot uh, allow our daughter to be defiled, so if you all circumcise all your men, that will be okay. Jacob tried to find diplomacy. For him, it's like, I'm in the land. I can't get out of here. I got to be here. This is the promises of Abraham. Boy, I spent 20 years with Laban, and I don't want to go back. You know, I'm in the land. But Simeon, and Levi didn't agree with her dad. So they said, yeah, yeah, have them all circumcised. And, in, you know, they didn't have anesthetics and all that. I don't know how they circumcised. You know, they put it on a rock and took a flint thing. And I don't even know, think about it. <laughs> you know, but, but after three days, they say this is where the pain is at its worst. And what Simeon and Levi did, they waited for three days. And after three days, when all the men of the city were, oh, they went and killed everybody. And Jacob did not agree with that. To use God's commandment for one's own purposes of revenge, Jacob was disgusted. He should be. We shouldn't do that. So he cursed Simeon and Levi at, at the, before he died. He... he Levi says, you, your violence. And he was, but later on, Levi made a good des decision with, in the story of the golden calf. So whereas the words of Jacob could not be reversed, Levi, since he didn't have a tribe, was given actually the priesthood. And in the priesthood, he was not, um, he didn't get a tribe, but each tribe had to give Levi a little area, a little area for the Levitical priests who were the one teaching Torah to everybody. So that, that's what really what, uh, what, what was going on. So God cannot reverse his word, but he can work around it somehow. So Levi got blessed for his later good decisions. So sometimes we make bad decisions, but a good later decision can change things. And that's a subject for another day. So, Levi. Levi actually takes us to the next con constellation. And I promise we're going to go faster now that I've laid on a lot of foundation. We, we'll go through the 12. You know, this is the second one. We have two days left. Uh, yeah, we'll go. 
you know, but this is the scales. Balance, scales, Libra, Libra. Now, uh, this is a, a picture that you have, and then this is some of the stars. You know, it's, a, it's, it's quite interesting. Now, what is Libra? We have seen Virgo. And Libra is the equalized scales. So we're talking about scales, you know, that you hold like this, or maybe there, you know, there's a needle, something in the middle, or a little needle like this. When the price is right is when the scales are equal and the needle is at zero. Okay? The price is right. Scales, the equalized scales, the debt is paid. Now, what does Levi have to do with it? scales, <laughs> really? Scales are a symbol of business. Um, there is a passage in a prayer that we often pray, forgive us our debts. That's an, you know, in the verses that I bring, you may see sometimes I play with the trans translations. I may use complete Jewish Bible, CG, CGB, CGB. CJB <laughs> or, or KJV, King James, or uh, ESV, English Standard Version, is because I choose the one that I think corresponds the best to the Hebrew that I'm reading. Okay? So, but here in ESV, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Oh boy, this is such a hard verse. We're telling God, hey, yes, forgive my debts to you like I forgive my debts from the people who owe me. And usually we don't forgive debts. We want payback. So this prayer in, in the, what we call the Avinu, our Father, is worded because the sages of Israel understood that a sin is, the, is, is considered like a debt we owe to God. That's the idea of sin. Sin is disobedience, violation of the commandment of God. And when we do that, we owe a debt to God. Okay, so, and, and basically, the debt we owe to God, we can never repay it. We don't have enough credit. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough virtue. We don't have enough anything to pay that debt. This, therefore, the scales of our account on him, with him, can never be equalized. We are doomed without a Messiah. We need a Messiah to equalize our account with God. He's like measure 11. You know, <laughs> when, when you go bankrupt and the government pays your debt, <laughs> right? You know that. Well, that's Yeshua. Yeah, so, he, chapter 11, yes. <laughs> Not measure 11, chapter 11. Bankruptcy. We are bankrupt with God. We need a chapter 11 Messiah. So, so uh, now, whereas the human manifestation of Messiah happened about 2,000 years ago, the Messiah was created way at the beginning. I'm explaining about those scales, okay? The Messiah was created really in the beginning. Here's what I'm, I'm, I'm too young to know, but I can read the word. I'm old enough to read the word, which says in the, wor the, the, the words of King David, the Lord said to me in, in, in the Hebrew, it is uh, for Lord, it says yod heh vav he, which is referring to God. <coughs> You are my son. <coughs> the, the Lord is God. The me is Messiah. 
talking through King David. It's Psalm 2. Psalm 1 is messianic, Psalm 2 is messianic. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. I've chosen the ESV because I know it says, Hayom yaladeticha. Yaladeticha means I have begotten you. In the King, complete Jewish Bible, it says, I became your father. No, that's not what it says in the Hebrew. It says, Yaladeticha, which means I begot, I begot you. That's what it talks about Messiah. And it talks about a particular day, today. I don't know what that day is. It's not on our calendar. But it says today. Whoa, am I getting into hot water here? Look at this other verse in Revelation 13, 8. It says, Everyone living on earth will worship it. It is the beast, the Antichrist. Oop. Except those whose name are written in the book of life. We talk about the book of life at Yom Kippur, right? In the book of life, belonging to the Lamb. And look what it says next. The Lamb slaughtered before the world was founded. Oh, I thought the Lamb was slaughtered 2,000 years ago. But here it says, the Lamb slaughtered before the world was founded. So follow me, follow me here. There are seven things that Jewish teachers teach were created before creation. Before, in the beginning, you know, it says, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, that's Genesis 1 1. And the world was blah, blah, blah. And the earth was confusion, tohu, vahuvu in Hebrew. What we don't know, you know, for me, I read that, it sounds like an essay. You know, if I wrote an essay about today, I says, well, I would say, I would write and say, um, during the third week of October, I went to a Messianic Tabernacles event. Period. I started working on it the year before, then I tell the story. So it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The title of the essay, period. And the earth was, oh, wait a minute. How much time did happen between those two verses? I don't know. Genesis 6 talks about Noah, which happens 1,500 years. Give or take a couple of hundred. In six chapters, we'll cover 1,500 years. So I don't know how, how much time happened. What happened? What happened? The, the lamb slaughtered before the, the world was founded. The lamb before slaughtered before, cre before God says, and let there be light, or let the waters be separated. That's what it's talking about. I'm not making it up. It's straight from Revelation 13, 8. So, in Jewish teaching, there's the seven things were created before creation. Repentance. The seven was created before creation. Messiah, the name of Messiah, before creation. That's why Yom Kippur works. You know, we talked about Yom Kippur, how the, the red thread that the priest put on the horn of the one sheep for Azazel, it turned white as a miracle. As you, if your sin be as scarlet, they will become white as snow. It turned white. They put some by the, by the cliff that they, they threw the goat off. And on the temple, on the door of the temple, it would turn white. It worked because the miracle that needed to happen happened before. Before the foundation of the world. Um, of the Levitical, um, the Levitical service we're talking about levi the scale okay of the Le levitical service paul says they are a shadow of things to come but the body of messiah people say the old testament is irrelevant oh my gosh paul never said that he didn't say they were irrelevant they're a shadow of the real stuff if you take away the shadow you don't have a real stuff if you take the real stuff you don't have the shadow 
that were like a precursor showing us what was going to happen, how God had a plan for the redemption of the whole world through the manifestation of Messiah 2,000 years ago, and that the Levitical service was leading us to that idea, to that place. The shadow comes from something. There's got to be something physical to create a shadow. Um, so that's why Yom Kippur worked. So the Levitical service was an early messianic ministry form. The Levitical service, I would say, equalized the scales through the daily offering. The daily, the sacrifices that you read in first uh, in Leviticus one one through five, was not just about sins. But the daily offering, morning and evening lambs, those were having to do with redemption. A redemption that we can never pay, never, ever, ever, ever pay for that redemption. But the blood of a lamb was more worthy of our blood. It makes sense to me. As humans, we're different than lambs. One of the big differences between humans and animals is that humans have choice to live by virtue instead of by instinct. Animals only live by instinct. A sheep will act like a sheep. A dog will act like a dog. A gerbil will act like a gerbil and eat its children when it doesn't have enough space in its cage. They're not given a choice to live by virtue. Humans are. And sad to say, we often choose to act like animals. Live by instinct. I want, I want, I want, I need, I need, I need. Me, me, me. That's living like, like an animal. By virtue is you, you, you. You want, you want, you want. You need, you need, you need. That's living by virtue. So the blood of an animal who just does what he's supposed to do is cleaner, especially a lamb, a sheep, is cleaner, than, is purer than ours, where we, we don't do what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to live, be children of God. But we live like animals. You see, so the blood of a lamb, of a dove, of a goat, of a cow, those are all domesticated animals who serve. Okay, doves were used for courier. You know, so... Those animals who do what they're supposed to do are purer than us who don't do what we're supposed to do. So, so the Levitical sacrifice was like an equalizer. We put our identity in that sheep, that goat, that, that bull, that dove. And we say here, by the blood of this, and, even to t and without that, People could not come to God. People had to come that bring that animal to the altar, bleed it at the altar themselves, not the priest. You yourself do the dirty job of cutting that throat, the, you know, and uh, to see how bloody sin is. You get that blood in your ha on your hand, you know, and and then the priest can bring it. The priest at Yom Kippur, whatever, brings it to the tabernacle. And uh, it's a little bit like today. We do not approach God. What? We only approach him through the blood of the Lamb, through Yeshua. We can only approach God through Yeshua, just like it was in the Levitical system, which was a shadow of the real thing. Does that make sense? Okay, so... What are the decans of our scale? Here we are. The decans of our, the lesser constellation that go along with the Libra are the cross. Do you see the cross? Yeah, the cross. It's called the crux, you know, but the cross. 
you know, Christians have a very romantic relationship with that cross. Jews don't. <laughs> For Jews, it has been an instrument of torture and death for millennia. I would almost dare to say for a Jew, a cross is almost like a swastika. It is. And Messianic Jews, people like me, have had to reconcile themselves with the idea of the cross. To me, when I hear on the cross of Christ or some text that Paul uses when he talks about the cross, for me, I don't think about a, a shape like this or I'm going to go kiss the cross or the cross is going to take my demons away. I, to me, it's not about the object. I know that Judaism, Semitic texts talk a lot in, in imagery, imagery. The Lord is my shepherd. God's not a shepherd. God is spirit. He's not a shepherd leading sheep. It's, it's really imagery. Because imagery is beautiful. Imagery, you know, they say a picture speaks a thousand words. I'm a writer. So sometimes I remember when I was writing my devotionals, I uh, tried to put in one page what I should put in a book. Ah, how do I do that? Imagery. Because a picture speaks a thousand words. You know, so... So uh, when he says the cross, he's not talking about the object. The object of torture and death, asphyxiation. I mean, it's like, yak. He's talking about the manner in which Yeshua died. The innocent victim, the blood of an innocent, that's the cross. When he says, if anybody will be my disciple, he needs to carry his cross daily. That's what Yeshua says. It means to carry his cross daily doesn't mean you go with a cross and you carry it, you know. What does it help anybody with? What he means is that when we're disciples, we will, we will be subject to injustice. As disciples, we'll be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Just like Yeshua was. And we'll be more as the days go on into the latter days. That's what it means to carry our cross. To accept that when we say yes to Yeshua and the mission he has for us, we, saying, we say yes to being persecuted, hated without a cause. Persecuted for righteousness sake. Reviled. Hated, spat upon, hit for the good that we try to bring the world. That's what it means to carry the cross. If anybody will be my disciple, he says, he needs to carry his cross daily. To me, that's what I see by the cross. Not an instrument of death and torture, but the manner for which he died. Because what, what pays that debt I'm talking about is that he who had no debt paid mine. He who had no debt, because he didn't sin, paid my debt. He said, oh, you have a debt to my father? Here. I pay it. He didn't have to. And I, I believe that's what we're called to do as disciples. That's what he said. Anybody who will be my disciple needs to carry his cross in the same manner that he did daily. Oh, daily? Oh, my. Can it be weekly? He said daily. Oh, that would work. <laughs> you know, so, so, um, so, so it's really important. So, so here, what do we have here? The friends of Libra the cross, and that, that, that picture in the middle is called, according again, and that will be a class for another day, according to the stars, the names of the stars called the innocent victim. Lupus is called. It's a wolf. Lupus is a wolf in Latin. 
It's called the innocent, so that the cross, where the innocent victim was, but who becomes a king? Because he did that, he became a king. That's what Libra teaches us, you know. So, so in Virgo, we have she who, mir who gives miraculous birth to the child. In Libra, we see the work of the child. Now, there is another guy in the picture. Scorpio. Now, Scorpio tells us about the other guy in the story. So, Scorpio is a picture of the enemy. He pretends to be your friend. That's the next one in the ecliptic line, okay? Ecliptic circle. Yeah, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio. We're getting into winter. You know, September is Libra, then you go, you know, November, Scorpio, early November, something. The scorpion pretends to be your friend, smiles you, and then he turns around, poof, gets you with his tail. So, uh, he represents the killer enemy, a traitor too, hypocrite, and pretend to your face and as he goes out, you know. Very nice picture of the devil, which is... Uh, Represented as a snake in the story. So what, what do I have next here? Okay. Oh, what do I have here? Okay. So I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your descendant and your descendant. So this is the guy we're talking about, the snake, the scorpion. How do you get rid of a snake? You got to hit him on the Head. Anywhere else will not work. He can still get you. It's got, you got to get him on the head. So this is why he will bruise your head. Hey, it's going to bruise your heel, but he will bruise your head. So here is a picture of our zodiac here. Uh, this is a, I made it smaller. But do you see the Virgo? To the left, Berenice is actually the one that is the coma child. The Greeks changed. They took that and they, they took that into a Greek thing. But it's the coma child. And it's all written in this book I showed you. But do you see under the feet of the Virgo, there is something looking like an eel or something? It's the serpent. His name is Draco. Draco, serpent. In, 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 in Latin. Now, look at what John saw in Revelation 12. There was a great sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, under her feet the moon, and on her head a crown of, tw crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant, ready to give birth, and there was a serpent under her waiting. Again, we were talking yesterday, I was saying how John must have been there during the fall feast, which very often fall in mid-September on. He hears the voice like a shofar. He, he sees heaven open. And this is a description of the skies above. It's in Virgo. We're still in Virgo right now. You know, we're still in Virgo until uh, a few more days. So anybody who knows astronomy says, huh, that's a little bit strange. So, and that same thing happened in, in November, no, in September 2017. You can predict this thing. You, there is a program called Stellarium. You can use that, you know, so. So, but... Uh, But uh, I didn't put it. Sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. But uh, in the constellation, oh, yeah, we have all the Scorpio things here. Here. In the Scorpio constellations, so you have Scorpion, Scorpion here. 
And above, you have, so usually I told you they always had three friends. And I'll show you two more. So where, where's the third one? Well, the, above the Scorpio, you, there's two of them. There is the serpent, and there's somebody holding that serpent. Now, if you hold the serpent, you have control over the serpent. So that serpent is controlled. Again, this is serpent, the devil, controlled by Messiah. We should, you know, you know, very often we do wrong things happen and we blame the serpent. Oh, the devil, the devil, the devil. Uh-uh. The devil doesn't need any help for us, to, for us to misbehave. We do a very good job at it just by ourselves. And the devil is, in, is under the control of Yeshua. The only, and, and, and we're the ones who have free choice. You know, so we need to look inside for things. And then, so he's controlled. And then the next one, of course, the name is Hercules. You know, it's uh, today still, it's Hercules. Now, Hercules was one who did 12 miraculous works. But here, the, what does it show here? He's got a snake, and he's hitting it over the head. Oh, is it really Hercules? Who bruises the serpent on the head? See, so, and again, we know this guy who, of course, they called him Hercules because maybe some of the Greeks influence and everything. But the idea, we have this person who hits the serpent on the head. He also controls the serpent, you know, the enemy. So here we have the scorpion, the enemy serpent, who is being controlled by the Messiah and actually hits him on the head, just like we read in, Rev in uh, Genesis 1, 3. Um, so, that all fits together. How much time do I have? What does that mean? <laughs> I'd like to finish the, the first volume. Okay, I can do that. So, this is the first three ones of the first coming of Messiah, okay? Do you follow me so far? We're going to go through the fourth chapter of that first volume, which will close the volume. Yeah! Really? Uh, maybe I should stop here. Maybe I should stop here. We'll do the next one tomorrow. Okay. But isn't all that interesting, fascinating? And again... People didn't go dot to dot trying to make the stars fit to the story. The story, the pictures were made to, to fit what was told by the names of the stars themselves. And that book that I showed you tells all about it. It's not the only book about it. You know, so, Abba Father, we thank you that... Uh, uh, we're able to see um, these things. We thank you that we have somebody who pays our debt. We thank you that our debt is paid. Help us to show our gratitude, gratitude for that through living our lives, living lives who show that we are a worthy investment. B'Shem Yeshua Mashiach, Amen.